Welcome back to another hardware news recap, talking about industry and hardware news for the last week. This one has a lot of AMD topics in it. RX Vega and Threadripper were a focus of attention as we traveled out to California for AMD's event. But there are also some other interesting movings in the industry like Corsair and their partial acquisition, the AMD quarter two financials, the biggest chip maker changing over to Samsung, and a couple of other news topics for the week. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus three 120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. Let's start out with some quick, less formal news. This is stuff that we've either uh, kind of thought about or loosely mentioned, but haven't uh, formally put out in a video. So the first one is RX Vega and its mining capacity. We independently confirmed some of the rumors that were going on. Haven't tested it, mind you, but from what we've heard from our sources in the industry, it does sound like, in fact, RX Vega, I'm not clear on if it's 56 or 64, will be confirmed at somewhere around 70 mega hashes per second for mining. Now, I, I think that's about 2x what the RX 500 series does, caps out at with the 580. We are not mining experts. Feel free to discuss it below if you want to talk about the implications of that. But I thought I'd put it out there that, in the very least, that's what we've heard from sources. Haven't confirmed it in testing ourselves, but that's what we've heard. So that does sound like it is accurate if you saw those rumors earlier. Another note here, AIB partner cards for Vega 64 should be available in September or very late August, but it does look like September for most of them, with reference cards, of course, shipping much sooner. August 14th, I believe, is the officially confirmed release date. That's at least the one we've seen talked about online publicly. So looking like August 14th reference, and then September for AIB partner models for the 64, and then RX Vega 56 reference, and therefore AIB partner models will be shipping in September as well. So 56 comes a bit later and probably won't be in the first review cycle, though we're not clear on that yet. And then finally on the, well, two more notes here. One is the Vega Mini. We didn't mention this in any of our coverage because it was shown surprise last minute at the AMD uh, stage event at their California gathering, but the RX Vega Mini was given to Tim Sweeney, the Epic Games CEO, and it's basically, it was a single fan, looked like 90 to 100 millimeter Vega card. And we're not sure if it was even real or if it was a prop, but either way, it was a, uh, a, a reference or an allusion to AMD's plans for RX Vega in the future, which would theoretically include a mini model. But we haven't heard anything actually definitive on if there is a functional one, if it's coming out with the September launches or what the deal is. But there, there will be one, it seems like. So thought we'd let you know. Uh, final note here, coin mining. So back to the opening topic, uh, Rajak Dori at the event said on stage to, uh, to media, he said, many of you asked why we're so good at coin mining. It resides in the, the sort of brackets here, the way we are open. This is not something that we planned. It's what the open software approach does, referring to how the drivers are designed and firmware is designed and things like that. Uh, later discussion at follow-up meetings revolved around the packs, those bundle packs, and how they're trying to limit purchases from miners and get some more cards into hands of gamers. Now the challenge here is there's no reason that you as a miner couldn't just still buy the standalone card and screw the pack, what do you care? But uh, the way to bypass that would be allocating a specific amount of cards to the packs or the bundles. So if AMD has the leverage to go to Newegg or Amazon or whomever and say, you must allocate 20%, 50%, whatever, of your RX Vega allocation to these bundles, meaning that that amount has to be sold alongside the discount packages at the marked up price of $100 uh, price premium. So the challenge here again is one, uh, miners don't seem like, if, if they're really gonna be that good at mining, it doesn't seem like miners would care about buying for an extra $100 and just not using the discounts. Like, I mean, what do they care? You're not forced to buy other hardware with those discounts. They're just discounts. You pay $100 for them, so you're paying an extra $100 to get $100 off of specific defined Ryzen 7 1700X, 1800X, uh, and specific X370 motherboards. 
and you're paying that extra $100, same amount, to get the $200 discount on Samsung displays. But uh, there's nothing that says you have to use them. So I, I don't know that it'll stop miners who $100 to them is like, compared to, compared to the 2X markup they're paying on 500 series cards, that really doesn't seem like such a bad deal to just overpay by 100 bucks. So I don't know if it'll work, uh, not really sure. The packs in general, I'm not really sure if they'll work. They, they have a lot of limitations that make them kind of odd. Um, but they, it seems like AMD's trying. At least that's what they told us and other media that they do want more gamers to get their hands on the Vega cards than Polaris has been the past few months. So we'll see if they can find a way to do that. It really doesn't seem like a good solution other than retailers doing something like saying limited one or two per customer, at which point, I don't know. I, I don't really believe that someone like Newegg would necessarily do that unless they're forced to because uh, Newegg seems like the type that they'd just be like, we just need to sell the cards. We don't care who they go to. And why would they? They're just a retailer. So I don't know. It's a really difficult challenge. AMD is in a difficult spot with Vega launching, ignoring performance entirely. The mining aspect of things really throws a wrench in what we know from traditional GPU launches. This isn't normally going on in the middle of something like a launch with a card that is uh, somewhat confirmed to be a good mining device. So very interesting, but uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see for the rest. Anyway, moving on to industry news. So Corsair is a big one. Corsair confirmed its acquisition, at least partial acquisition, by Eagle Tree Capital, who paid $525 million to buy out the stake that Francisco Partners previously held. We talked about this in one of the previous news episodes, which it was a rumor at the time, but now obviously confirmed. So Francisco Partners and minority shareholders have been bought out for 500 plus million dollars. Andy Paul, the founder and CEO, and other upper management will remain in place at Corsair from what uh, the statements have said, and things should more or less remain functioning as is. At least that's what they're saying right now. Uh, this also kind of loosely mirrors Razor's plans to go public. Razor was trying to raise $600 million to bid aggressively on growth opportunities and expansion. So it looks like they're both kind of doing this right now. But the Corsair rumor did actually become true. For the next one, AMD revealed its quarter two 2017 fiscal results, which Ryzen was shown to help AMD get back into profitability, at least somewhat. Last week, AMD announced their second quarter fiscal results. The numbers are hopeful overall. AMD's revenue was up 19% year over year, albeit net income suffered a loss of 16 million. But that's a far improvement over last quarter, where AMD saw a loss of 73 million. For quarter three, AMD is expected a 23% increase compared to this quarter, which should help their bottom line overall. And so that is owed to the success of Ryzen, and AMD is now creeping back towards being profitable. Again, 16 million loss versus what we were seeing previously. Quarter three should allow the impact of Threadripper, Epic, and RX Vega to soak a bit, which round out AMD's a sale on the market segments for this year. And then the SOC business is still being bolstered by forthcoming launches like the Xbox One X. So AMD's got some room to move around still. We'll have to see how it looks when the quarter three and four results are posted. Then this one's kind of interesting. So Intel for the last 20 or so years has been the single largest silicon manufacturer on the planet. And now with Samsung continuing to grow with the phone market booming the way it is, Samsung has actually overtaken Intel for the first time in about 20 years. And they are now doing quarterly earnings of 15.8 billion against Intel's 14.8 billion for quarterly earnings. And the shot in the arm to Samsung's coffers is largely due to demand for NAND, which as you all know, is pretty high right now, given the prices of SSDs and RAM and things like that. So demand for NAND, for DRAM and phones, computers still, tablets, laptops, basically everything, medical devices, means that Samsung is growing rapidly and uh, they are doing well despite the global supply constraints in those markets. So it uh, only serves to drive up prices a bit in DRAM and SSD areas right now. Hopefully it comes down, but it doesn't look like it's gonna happen anytime soon. And ultimately it looks like Intel is going to be trailing Samsung for the remainder of the year. So uh, Samsung's getting bigger. If they weren't big enough already with selling the home appliances, washers, dryers, solid state drives, phones, everything else. 
uh, yeah, so 15.8 billion quarterly against Intel's 15 billion. Pretty big growth. The next one here, Fantax has pulled the curtain on prices and availability finally for the pair of cases that they showed at Computex earlier this year. Both are tall cases built with aluminum and tempered glass. The Evolve Shift and Evolve Shift X will be available in August for $110 and $160 respectively. Also in case news here, last week Silverstone announced their latest small form factor case, the RBZ03, which resembles something akin to a console. It's loosely based on the previous RBZ01. The new chassis has updates to styling and includes RGB lighting, which Silverstone talked to us about at Computex and they really weren't sure at the time, but I guess demand got the best of them. The RBZ03 supports mini DTX and ITX motherboards, an ATX power supply, three 120mm fans, two expansion slots, a couple of other things you'd expect, and GPUs up to 330mm in length. It's being offered in Europe already. US prices and availability will be coming soon. The final new product to talk about is the OCZ TR200 from Toshiba, which is an entry-level SSD and the company's first to use the BICS flash or BitCost scalable flash based NAND. The new SSD will replace the previous TR150, comes in capacities of 240 and 960 gigabytes with one in between. The drives come with a three year warranty and uh, advertise a 240 terabytes written total endurance rating. And that's all on a SATA six gigabit per second interface. According to Toshiba, the TR200 series will be aimed at entry level system builders and first time upgrades from hard drives. Availability expected this fall with no word on pricing yet. The last one here of note is AMD and yes, they're back. There's a lot of AMD news this week, given that they just did their event, but they're now offering their Wraith coolers through retail. So that's actually pretty interesting. The Wraith cooler previously was only available in bundles with the 1700X or 1800X if you paid the extra money to get it. And now, it will be shipping for $60 separately through retailers, and it's compatible with AM4, AM3 Plus, and FM2 motherboards. When the Wraith coolers originally shipped, the original, original one from the FX series, we actually praised them for stepping aside from what the usual stock cooler performance was, i.e. bad, and making something that was pretty good, usable, and didn't actually require replacing. Now, of course, you could always do better than a box cooler. It's only gonna charge you so much after all but we liked the original Wraith on the FX series, and it's not been bad on the Ryzen series. Again, you can do better, but uh, considering what the performance is out of box, it's a good way to save money if you don't want to buy something extra. The Wraith itself, though, is now available separately. At $60, it's kind of hard to say whether there's actually value there versus buying an aftermarket solution. Those will probably be better, but if you want the AMD branding, and I think they have an RGB LED on there as well, and you can grab the Wraith Max. So that's out there now. I think that pretty much wraps it for this week. There are a couple of other small announcements like from Razer and Rocket with new headsets, but we've got all the big ones. So as always, you can find more information on the website, gamersnexus.net, or linked in the article in the description below. Subscribe for more, patreon.com slash gamersnexus, top us out directly, and I'll see you all next time.